Sunday the 8th of July, when Emil went on the spree on Hultsford Plain. Alfred, the farmhand at Cuthold, was very fond of children. He liked Emil especially and didn't mind him being a scamp and getting into mischief. He had carved him a fine wooden gun. It looked exactly like a real one, though you couldn't shoot it, of course. But Emil yelled, BANG! BANG! and shot with it anyhow, so that the cattle sparrows did not go out for several days. Emil loved his gun and insisted on having it in bed with him every night. Yes, he loved his gun, and still more he loved Alfred, who had made it for him. So it wasn't surprising that Emil cried when Alfred went away to Hultsford Plain for his military training. That's what it's called when men learn to be soldiers. All the farmhands in Lernerberg and everywhere else have to learn to be soldiers. And fancy them having to go out just when it's haymaking time, said Emil's father. He didn't at all like having to do without Alfred during the haymaking, and that was a busy time in Catholt. However, it wasn't Emil's father, but the king and his generals who decided when the farmhand should go to Hultsford Plain and learn to be soldiers. Besides, Alfred would be able to come back home again when he had finished his training, and that wouldn't take very long. So there was no need for Emil to go on crying like he was, but he did cry all the same, and so did Lena. Because Emil wasn't the only one who was fond of Alfred, you see. Alfred didn't cry, though. He said one could go on the spree and have great fun in Hultsford. And when the trap went off with him and they were all standing sadly waving farewell, he grinned and sang and made jokes to cheer them up. This is part of what he sang. Oh, ex, your town is full of girls who love to go a-dancing. Hey, diddle, diddle, dee doo And so they do on Hultford Plain, where pretty Maud and Kate and Jane, with singing skirts and bobbing curls, sing hey, diddle, diddle, dee doo their bright eyes gaily glancing. Hey, dee doo diddle, diddle, dee doo that was the last they heard, for Lena started to howl for all she was worth, and the trap disappeared around the corner, carrying Alfred away to do his military training. Emil's mother tried to comfort her. Cheer up, Lena, she said. Wait till the 8th of July, when there's a fate in Hulsford Plain, and we'll go and see Alfred then. I want to go on the spree and see Alfred at Hulsford too, said Emil. So do I, said little Eda. But Emil's mother shook her head. It's no place for small children at such a time, she said. They'd get lost in the crowd. But I like getting lost in the crowd, said Emil. But it was no use. Emil's father and mother and Lena went off to the Hultsford fete on the morning of the 8th of July, leaving Emil and little Eda at home with Kroza Maya, who was to look after them. She was an old woman who sometimes came to Cuttle to lend a hand at various jobs. Little Eda was a good child. She sat on Cruiser Maya's knee and got her to tell her some of the most dreadful ghost stories, which delighted Eda. But not so Emil. He was absolutely furious and went out behind the stables with his gun. I won't have it, he said. I'm going to halt straight on the spree like everybody else, and that's that. Do you understand, Eulen? This last remark was addressed to their old mare, which was grazing in the meadow behind the stables. They had a young horse too at Cuttle, named Marcus, but at the moment Marcus was on the way to Hultsford with Emil's father and mother and Lena. Yes, some people could go off and enjoy themselves. Well, I know two who are soon going after them at top speed, said Emil, and that's you and me, Eulen. And that is what happened. Emil put the bridle on the old mare and led her out of the meadow. There's nothing to worry about, he told Eulen. Alfred will be pleased when I turn up, and you're sure to find another nice old mare to whinny at, if you're not much good at going on the spree. He pushed Eulen up against the gate, so that he could climb on her back. He was a smart lad, was Emil. Off we go, said Emil. Gee up, gee up! We'll say goodbye to Cruz and Maya when we get back home. So Eulen went clopping off down the hill with Emil, and he sat up straight and cocky with his gun in front of him. Yes, that too had to go to Hultsford. 
because if Alfred was going to be a soldier, Emil thought he himself could be one as well. Alfred had a rifle, Emil had a gun, which was practically the same thing. They were both soldiers, and that was the way Emil wanted it to be. Eulen was old. She didn't go fast when she trotted, and so they shouldn't lose headway entirely. Emil sang to her, My old grey mare may be knock-kneed, but she keeps up a steady speed, so I don't care. I'm carrying a loaded gun, so just be careful, everyone, beware, beware. Well, with Yule and plodding and lumbering and clopping along, she and Emil did arrive at Hultford Plain at last. Hey! cried Emil. Now we can go on the spree. But he stopped short and stared wide-eyed. He knew well enough that there were lots of people in the world, but not that the whole lot of them had crowded onto the Hultford Plain. He had never seen so many people. They stood in thousands all around the great level plain, and right in the middle of it were soldiers drilling, shouldering arms, and turning left and right, and doing the things soldiers do. A fat, cross little man was riding around on a horse, shouting and bellowing at the soldiers, telling them what to do, and they let him shout, and did just what he wanted them to do. Emil thought this was very strange. "'Isn't Alfred in charge of things?' he asked a couple of peasant lads close by. But they just looked at the soldiers and didn't answer. Emil, too, thought it fun to watch the soldiers shoulder arms, though not for long, because first and foremost he wanted to find Alfred. That was why he had come. But all the soldiers were wearing blue uniforms and looked alike. It wasn't easy to pick Alfred out in the crowd. Oh, well, just wait till Alfred sees me, said Emil to Eulen. He'll come along shouting, Hey there! And that cross old chap can bash about with a rifle as much as he likes. And in order that Alfred should see him, Emil rode right in front of all the soldiers and hallooed as hard as he could. Hello! Where are you, Alfred? Come on, so that we can go on the spree. Can't you see it's me? Yes, Alfred saw well enough that Emil was there with his gun and his cap and his old mare. But he stood amongst the crowd of soldiers not daring to come forward because of the fat, angry little man who shouted and bellowed and kept giving orders the whole time. Instead, however, the fat little man came riding up to Emil and said very kindly, What's the matter, my boy? Have you lost your mummy and daddy? It was the silliest thing Emil had heard for a long time. I'm not lost, he said. I'm here. If anyone's lost, it's my mother and my father. And actually, he was perfectly right. His mother had said that small children might get lost in Hulsford Plain. But now she and Emil's father and Lena were all in the thickest of the crowd, unable to move in the crush, and all feeling lost. But they did see Emil, with his cap and gun and the old mare, and his father said, That means another wooden doll for Emil. Yes, indeed, sighed his mother. But how are we going to get hold of him? Yes, that was the point. If you have ever attended the sort of fate they have in Hultsford Plain, you will understand what a squash there was. As soon as the soldiers had finished drilling and marched off, the entire place became crammed with people. There was such a turmoil that you could scarcely find yourself, let alone Emil. Not only did Emil's father and mother want to get hold of him, but so did Alfred, because he was free now and didn't have to train any more. Now he wanted to be with Emil and have some fun. But it was impossible to find anyone in all that crowd. Nearly everybody was going around looking for somebody. Alfred was hunting for Emil, Emil was looking for Alfred, Emil's mother was looking for Emil, Lena was hunting for Alfred, and Emil's father was looking for his mother. Yes, she really was lost for a time, and Emil's father had to search for nearly two hours before he found her, jammed between two big fat men from Vimmerby, and almost in despair. Emil found nobody, and nobody found Emil. So he realised that he would have to start going on the spree all by himself, if he meant to do it all. Before he started, though, he must arrange for Eulen to have some nice old mare to whinny with meanwhile, for he had promised her as much. He didn't find an old mare, but he found Marcus, which was actually much better. Marcus was standing fastened to a tree at the edge of the wood eating hay, and close by was the trap from Cuttled. You could see Eulen was glad when she met Marcus again. 
Emil tied her to the same tree and fetched a pile of hay from the trap. Eulen started munching at once, and then Emil realised that he too was quite hungry. But I won't eat hay to start with, he told himself. And he didn't need to either. There were lots of little stalls where you could buy sandwiches and sausages and buns and cakes galore if you had the money. And there were heaps of jolly things to do and see. The circus, the dancing and amusement parks, and merry-go-round, and other delights. Imagine there was a sword swallower who could swallow swords, and a fire-eater who could eat fire, and a grand lady with a beard who couldn't swallow anything except coffee and buns. Of course that wouldn't make her rich. It was quite a good thing that she had a beard. She let people see it if they paid for doing so, and she made quite a bit of money that way. But everything cost money, and Emil had no money. However, he was a smart little chap, as I've already said. He wanted to see as much as he could, and he began with the circus, for that was the easiest. You only had to climb up on a box at the back of the tent and peep through a hole in the canvas. But Emil laughed so much at the funny clown who was running around inside the tent that he fell off the box backwards and banged his head on a stone. Ouch! That put him off the circus. Besides, he was hungrier than ever. "'You can't go on the spree without food,' he said to himself, "'and I can't get any food without any money. I'll have to think.' He had noticed that people got money by various means in this place, so there must be a way in which he could do so too. He couldn't swallow swords or fire, and he didn't have a beard, so what could he do? He stood still reflecting. Then he saw a poor blind man sitting on a box in the middle of a crowd of people. He was singing the most doleful songs and sounded very melancholy, but he was getting money for it. He had put his hat on the ground beside him, and kind people kept throwing in small coins all the time. I can do that too, thought Emil, and luckily I've got my cap with me. He put the cap on the ground in front of him and began singing My Old Grey Mare. At once people gathered round him. Oh, what a dear little boy! they said. He must be very poor, as he's singing for money. At that time there were a great many poor children who had nothing to eat, and now a lady came along and said to Emil, Have you had anything to eat today, my little friend? Oh, yes, but only some hay, said Emil. They all felt very sorry for him. A dear little peasant from Vina had tears in his eyes as he looked at the poor little boy standing there alone who had such beautiful flaxen hair. They all started throwing two, five and ten urbits into Emil's cap. The nice little peasant from Vina drew a two urbit from his pocket but then changed his mind and stuffed it back again and whispered to Emil, If you come with me to my cart you shall have a little more hay. But now Emil had his cap full of money and was rich. He went to a stall and bought lots of sandwiches and buns and cakes and fruit drinks. When he had stuffed himself full of good things, he went on the merry-go-round forty-two times for four kroner and twenty euro. He had never been on one before, and hadn't known there was anything so jolly in the whole world. Now I'm on the spree, at all events, he thought, as he whirled round with his hair blowing in the breeze. I've had some fun before, but never anything to touch this. Then he looked at the sword swallower and the fire eater and the bearded lady, and after this he only had two urda left. I'll sing some more and get my cap full again, he thought. Everyone here is so nice. But then he realised he was feeling quite tired. He didn't want to sing any more and he didn't want any money, so he gave the blind man the two urda bit. Then he mooched round looking for Alfred. Emil was mistaken in thinking that everyone was nice. There were one or two bad characters who had gone to Hultsford Plain that day. At that time a horrible thief was terrorising the neighbourhood. He was called the Sparrow, and Schmarland went in fear of him. Many of his exploits figured in the Schmarland Times and the Hultsford Post. Whenever there was a fate or a fair where people and money were to be found, it was pretty certain that the sparrow would turn up and begin stealing anything he could lay his hands on. He wore different beards and moustaches every day, so as not to be recognised. He had come to Hultsford Plain that day and was slinking around in a black slouch and black moustache. Nobody knew he was the sparrow, or it would have caused great alarm amongst them all. 
But had the sparrow been wise, he wouldn't have come to Hultsford Plain at all that day, when Emil and his gun were there. For guess what happened? Emil was wandering around, looking for Alfred. He came past the bearded lady's tent, and through the opening he saw her sitting inside counting her money, for she wanted to see how much she had made for her beard on that one Sunday. It must have been quite a large amount, for she beamed and stroked her beard contentedly. Then she saw Emil. "'Come in, little boy,' she said. "'You may look at my beard for nothing, because you seem like such a nice little chap.' Emil had, as it happened, seen that beard before, but he wouldn't refuse the invitation, since it was to be gratis. He strode into the tent with his gun and his cap, and looked at the beard to the tune of about twenty-five euros worth. "'How did you get such a splendid beard?' he asked, politely. But the bearded lady never managed to reply, because at that very moment a terrible voice cried, "'Give me the money at once, or I'll cut off your beard!' It was the sparrow. He had sneaked inside the tent unnoticed. The bearded lady's face turned white, except where the beard was, of course. The poor soul was just going to let the sparrow have all of her money when Emil whispered, "'Take my gun!' and she took the gun Emil thrust towards her. It was pretty dark inside the tent, one couldn't see very clearly. The lady thought it was a real gun that you could shoot with, and the best of it was that the sparrow thought so too. Hands up or I'll fire! screamed the bearded lady. And then the sparrow's face turned white, and he put up his hands and stood trembling, while the bearded lady yelled for the police so loudly that she could be heard all over Hultsfield Plain. The police arrived, and that was the last that was seen of the sparrow in Hulsford, or anywhere else. And that put an end to the stealing in Schmarland. The bearded lady received plenty of praise in the Schmarland Times and Hulsford Post for having caught the sparrow. But nobody wrote a word about Emil and his gun, so I think it's time people should know the truth. It was a lucky thing I took my cap and my gun to Hulsford, said Emil, when the police had taken the sparrow off to the lock-up. Yes, you're a clever little chap, said the lady, and you shall have a look at my beard whenever you like, without paying. But Emil was really quite tired. He didn't want to look at a beard or go on the spree or anything for that matter. He only wanted to go to sleep, because it was getting pretty dark by now. Fancy, the whole day had passed without him even finding Alfred. Emil's father and mother and Lena were tired too. They had hunted and hunted for Emil, and Lena had hunted and hunted for Alfred, and now none of them could do anything more. "'Oh, my feet!' said Emil's mother, and his father nodded grimly. "'Yes, the fun of a fate this is,' he said. "'Come on, let's get home to Cuthold. There's nothing more we can do.' And they went off to the edge of the wood to harness the horse and get away but then they saw Eulen tied to the same trees as Marcus, eating hay. Emil's mother burst into tears. <laughs> Where is my little Emil? she said. But Lena tossed her head. He's always up to mischief, that boy, she said. He's a proper scamp. Then they heard somebody running up, quite out of breath. It was Alfred. <sighs> "'Where's Emil?' he asked. "'I've been hunting for him all day.' "'Oh, I don't care where he is,' said Lena. She clambered up into the trap to get home. And, fancy that, she stepped on Emil. There was a little hay left in the trap, and in that hay lay Emil asleep. But he woke up when Lena trod on him, of course. He saw who had just arrived and was standing there in his blue uniform, panting, and so he stretched out his arm and put it around Alfred's neck. "'So there you are, Alfred,' he said, and then fell back asleep. Then they went to Catholt. Marcus drew the trap and Ewell and trotted behind. Emil woke up from time to time and saw the dark wood and the light summer sky and smelt the horses in the evening air and heard the clop of hooves and the grating of the wheels. But for the most part he slept and dreamed that Alfred would soon come home to Cuthalt and to him. Which was true. It was the 8th of July when Emil went on the spree. Guess if anyone else had been looking for him that day? Well, ask Rosemeyer. No, actually don't, because she got a rash on her arms if you did, and it tickled and wouldn't go away. 
Now you have heard what Emil did on the 22nd of May, and the 10th of June, and the 8th of July, but there are lots of other days in the almanac for those who want to get up to mischief, and that's what Emil did. He got up to mischief almost every day of the year, but especially on the 19th of August, and the 11th of October, and also the 3rd of November. <laughs> I have to laugh when I think of what he did on the 3rd of November, but I shan't tell you, for I promised his mother I wouldn't. Though it was after that affair that the people of Lernerberger held a committee meeting. They pitied the cut old folk for having such a rascally boy. So they each contributed fifty euro and brought the money to Emil's mother in a bag. Perhaps this will be enough for you to send Emil away to America, they said. Well, that would have been a nice thing, sending Emil off to America. Who knows what they would have done for a president of the local council then? when the time came, I mean. Emil's mother would have nothing to do with such a silly suggestion. She was angry and flung down the bag so that the money flew out all over Lernerberger. Emil's a dear little fellow, she cried, and we love him just as he is. All the same, she was a bit troubled about Emil. Mothers are when people come and complain about their children. And that night, when Emil was in bed with his cap and his gun, she went up and sat beside him for a bit. Emil, she said, you'll soon be big enough to start school. What's to happen when you are such a nuisance and get up to so much mischief? Emil lay there looking like a little angel, with his round blue eyes and woolly flaxen hair. Tra la 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 la, he said, for he didn't want to listen. Emil! said his mother sternly. What do you think will happen when you begin school? Well, said Emil, I suppose I'll have to stop getting into mischief when I start school. Emil's mother sighed. Well, I really do hope so, she said, getting up and going towards the door. Then Emil popped his head over the side of the bed and smiled like a little angel and said, But I'm not quite certain. The End that was Sunday the 8th of July, when Emil went on the spree on the Holtzford Plain, by Astrid Lindgren. This story is an excerpt from Lindgren's original book entitled Emil in the Soup Tureen, translated from Swedish into English by Lillian Seaton. This story was read to you by Ingrid Stabey for Story Zone. <laughs> ¶¶